The Gorosei are immortal and incredibly powerful rulers from the Void Century that have been ruling the world together with Emu for the last 800 years. For one, we know that they haven't aged a day since the incident of Ohara 20 years ago. They are called the Five Elder Stars, even though some of them are not that old looking at all. They clearly know everything about the true history and what happened during the Void Century, as we can see when Dr. Clover tries to say the ancient kingdom's name. <laughs> And we know that they are the highest ranking celestial dragons, the world nobles who never leave the red line. So why exactly would they be covered in scars and carry weapons? Now if just one of them decided to go out and have an adventure, that might be an excuse, but all of them? The world government has existed for 800 years, so there clearly never was any reason for celestial dragons to actually fight themselves. Heck, even against Rock, the biggest threat to the world government we know of, Garp had to team up with Roger himself to defeat him. If the Gorosei were immortal, however, they could be the very kings who defeated the ancient kingdom and formed the world government in the first place. They could have actively fought in the war itself and then kept control ever since. That would also explain why they look and act completely normal compared to the other dumbed down and spoiled celestial dragons who have probably only had children within their small group of children. Ones. Yep, I'm saying there uh, might be some incest problem going on here. I mean, look at this. All of them run around with their spacesuits, shielding them from the air that normal humans breathe, while the Gorosei have normal clothes and have no problem being in the same room with a Kainu or even Shanks. And so all of these pieces of evidence together strongly suggest to me that these five men are the original celestial dragons that founded the world government with the help of Emu. Which, let's be honest, would also help in keeping the secret ruler of the world secret since they would have been the only five people who ever knew the truth since the Void Century, with no need to pass it all on every generation and risking exposure. But how did they end up becoming immortal in the first place? How powerful are these five men actually to casually dismiss someone like a Kainu and be in the same room as one of the Yonko without guards? And will the marines ultimately rebel against them? What's up, my name is Manu and even though I might not look like it, I'm actually very interested in politics and history, learning about how we got where we are today and how societies thrive or fail under different political systems. And I think in terms of One Piece, it doesn't get much more political than when talking about the five elders who run and govern the entire planet. In fact, what I find absolutely fascinating is that if you only have a vague idea of what One Piece is actually about, you'd probably be absolutely taken aback just how much politics is actually hidden under the classic layers of a shonen manga. <laughs> Not only do we encounter different political systems and structures with every new island we visit, but as the story progresses, we learn more and more about the workings of a political organization that rules the entire world. Which, now that I think about it, is actually pretty damn hilarious, because usually shonen manga are all about stopping an evil force from reaching world domination, while in One Piece, this has already happened centuries ago. And so the world of One Piece is actually a dystopia where a small group of inbred and cruel nobles living on top of the red line hold most of the wealth and slave and kill people at will and brainwash the population with propaganda and lies. <laughs> All while the people on the sea below live in poverty and despair and also in fear of a culture of pirates that has formed just because of these desperate conditions. What I love so much about Eiichiro Oda, the author of One Piece, is how he somehow managed to hide this dark and complex political foundation of his story under the mantle of the positive and fun adventure that Luffy and Co are on right now. <laughs> Yeah, Simona, Hatanaka! Tell us, get the credit. Someone will come up. 
So, even if you're someone who isn't really interested in the politics of a story, you still know exactly what's going on without even realizing it. And it makes the story enjoyable for a younger shonen audience as well, while the deep and dark parts are still clearly visible for the adults. To me, this just once again shows what a masterful writer Oda Sensei truly is. In a way, you could argue that the fight of the ancient kingdom versus what would later become the world government was the classic shonen setting. Luffy, on the other hand, is a hero that doesn't just have to stop the bad guys from winning, he has to change and liberate an entire planet that has been ruled and indoctrinated for almost 1000 years. Which to me makes things just much more interesting, because it's not enough to just beat the big bad guy to keep everything the way it is. No, Luffy as the hero has to actually present the world with a system that works better than the current one. And I'm very curious how people will react to the ideal system Oda has envisioned for the end of the story. Because like Let's be honest, no matter what it is, it's definitely gonna be controversial. Similarly to how we all kept wondering what political system the end of Game of Thrones would bring with it. Will the world of One Piece have a king? Complete anarchy in a pirate world? A democracy? This will have a big impact on all Luffy is achieving right now. So who are these five men that rule the world with an iron fist? Are they good or evil? How powerful are they? And if they truly are immortal, how? And what would it mean for the story if they came from the void century? <laughs> In case you need a refresher, the Five Elders, or Gorosei as they're called in Japanese, are a council of the most highly ranked celestial dragons with full control over the marines, the cypherpole agencies, and even the seven warlords of the sea. While we know neither their names nor their powers, we have seen them pulling the strings behind almost everything happening all over the world, politically rivaled only by the influence of the four emperors that actually hold both the necessary political and military power to deny the world government and rule over the new worlds. Now only quite recently have we learned that the Gorosei actually serve a mysterious figure called Imu who rules the world from the shadows. <laughs> However, while the elders obey his or her orders, it still very much seems like most of the time they still have full authority over the government's actions. First of all, why do I think that the Gorosei are very very powerful in reality and will be actual enemies that will have to be taken down? Because I've seen a lot of opinions stating that the Gorosei are basically glorified spandoms. That's this guy in case you forgot. Yeah! The reason Spandam was able to control some of the government's most powerful agents was not because he was smart enough to manipulate them, but because they were ordered by the government, in other words, the Gorosei, to help him. Now you could say that the main source of authority for the Gorosei is that they have both the marines and the cypherpole agencies under their command. However, how exactly do they keep authority over these groups? After all, there is no higher power actually backing them up. Well, actually, there is, but no Nobody knows about that. If they truly were just spandams, then surely in the 800 year history of the government, some marine or government agent would have tried to usurp them. Or heck, even the revolutionary army might have gone straight for the heads when they actually invaded Marijo. A Kainu out of all people surely wouldn't have listened to them if they didn't have anything to back up their authority. And yet Sengoku and a Kainu never think about actually going against them at least so far. However, I want you to notice just how calm the Gorosei are at Zakazuki's insolence. Normally, people would be trembling like Kobe at an angry Sakazuki, but the Gorosei simply shrug it off, mocking him and treating him like a tempered child. And honestly, weaklings don't show this type of confidence, especially since these five aren't stupid. And then later on, we see them casually meeting with one of the most powerful pirates in the entire world, dismissing their guards. Cool. No matter what powers they have at their disposal, the fact that they appear to have battle experience and unwavering authority over people like Akainu and Luchi 
proves to me that they all must be immensely physically powerful. Especially after they realized that they could subscribe to my channel for more weekly One Piece content. The big question I've always asked myself is, how evil are these guys? Or are they evil at all? This is a truly interesting question because I think, other than Doflamingo for example, the Gorosei are in a much more morally grey area. On the one hand, they lead a regime that uses slavery, neglects and manipulates its people and orders the destruction of an entire island. <laughs> But then Oda Sensei still throws in nuances that make them appear more human. During the Ohara incident, for instance, at least some of them seem truly pained with their decision. They actually wanted Jinbei to create a better relationship with the fishmen and allowed them access to the reverie. And they clearly were not happy with Doflamingo's actions, but couldn't do anything about it since he was a former celestial dragon himself with knowledge about the national treasure of Marijoa that he could have used as leverage against them. And out of all things, they seem to work with Shanks to keep the world in balance. This gets even more confusing when looking at Oda Sensei's inspiration for all five of them. What just keeps fascinating me every time I think about it is that all five of them seem to be inspired by influential historical political figures. Most prominently, there's this one who looks like Mahatma Gandhi. One of them looks like a young Abraham Lincoln, one like Karl Marx, one like Mikhail Gorbachev, and the one with the long beard like the Japanese politician Itagaki Taisuke. Now, all of these figures represent very different political ideologies, and all of them had their obvious flaws. But what still unites all of them, at least from a historic perspective, is that they all are associated with giving people more freedom. <laughs> Lincoln is known for ending slavery in the US, Gandhi ended British colonial rule in India, Marx's fundamental idea that was later strongly misused by multiple regimes was the theory of liberty, stating that the freedom of the people is the most important right that should not be exploited and controlled by those with power and money. Gorbachev was the last president of the Soviet Union, who with his ideas of glasnost and perestroika, openness and reconstructing, promoted democratic thinking and liberty in Eastern Europe that ultimately led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And finally, Itagaki was the leader of the freedom and people's rights movement and involved with the founding of the very first democratic political party in Japan. So I don't know, either Oda Sensei is being very ironic by basing the authoritarian rulers of this world on people fighting for freedom, or there's something more to all of this. To me personally, the main goal of the government seems to be keeping the balance of the world. They met with Shanks, they buy weapons from Kaido, and they dealt with Mother Caramel for powerful orphans. <laughs> Clearly, they have no interest in getting rid of the Yonko system, but rather promote it. There seem to be only two instances where the government seems to feel really threatened. One was the incident of Ohara that might have revealed the true history of the world, and the other was Emu's frustration with Luffy, Vivi, Poseidon and Blackbeard. No Kaido, no Big Mom, no Dragon. However, all of these four seem to have connections to the Void Century, except Blackbeard, who seems to have connections to Rox, who was also a major threat to the government. Luffy's straw hat connects him to the giant straw hat on Marijoa. Shirahoshi is an ancient weapon, and Vivi is connected to Pluton and the only one of the 20 kingdoms that didn't join the Celestial Dragons on the Red Line. As for Shanks, I don't think he's plotting with the government, but just trying his best to ease the way for Luffy and keep the world from falling apart before he even has the chance to find the One Piece. So are the Gorosei just interested in keeping things as they are and keep living in comfort forever? Well, they do seem to have a fairly stressful job though. I really can't wait to find out what their connection with Emu truly is, because I think it would be a very interesting twist indeed if one of them, either Emu or the Gorosei, were actually a quote-unquote good guy after all, keeping the other in check and from destroying the world. But let's talk about the immortality thing. 
There are actually a number of theories out there that connect Emu and the Gorosei to immortality. One option being of course the Ope Ope no Mi that might have been used multiple times. Another theory is connected to the reoccurring theme of flowers, a golden flower that connected Emu and Nika and the Lunarians. I should probably make just an entire video about that idea in itself. And the biggest theory with the most evidence behind it is this video right here, where I explain all the reasons why Emu and the Celestial Dragons are immortal and what the secret behind that might actually be. You know, if you're interested there, can't click it, don't have to, but you might as well.